Brethren, we're having some multiple technical difficulties this evening, so we're going to start just a shade early. We look for our scripture reading. Please turn to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, we'll begin in verse 6. For there shall be a day that the watchman upon Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chiefs of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together. A great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping and with supplication will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're unworthy to make supplication to you. Lord, be with us. Forgive our sin while we pray. Lord, comfort your people. Ease their hearts. Calm them. Lead them by those still waters, Lord, as you have led us. Lord, lead us to the end. Be with our brethren that are suffering. Lord, just give them a grace to look to Christ. In his name that we ask. Amen. All right, if you will, let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're working through Romans, and uh, us arriving at these verses is a timely thing. I met a man this week, and... Uh, having some work done to our house, and he gave me some unsolicited advice on prayer. He found out I was a pastor. And he said, well, because I know you didn't ask me, but I'm going to tell you some things. He gave me some advice. And if he's tuning in, if he's listening, I did not pick these verses to prove my point. I didn't do it to pick on him. I hope he understands that. Even look back through the history of the messages, what's been uploaded, and see this is where we are. We got verse 26 and 27 here in Romans chapter 8 tonight. But the timing of this text and our Lord's sovereign providence, I would urge them, if they were to tune in, to listen carefully. And I would urge us to listen carefully. I urge myself as I study this to listen carefully. Let's look here at Romans 8 and verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of you, <clears throat> mind of the Spirit. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. As we went through Romans, there in chapter 7, Paul shows us the daily life of a believer, our daily thoughts, the daily battles that rage inside of us. How the struggle with our flesh is so overwhelming at times, how weak we are sometimes, how we do the things that we don't want to do. How a new man looks to Christ in all things, but that old man looks to the flesh. The old man looks around us. What's going on? That's what that old man does. And the apostle shows us the infirmity of our flesh. 
what our sickness is, what our illness is, and the two natures that every true believer has inside themselves. But here in chapter 8, we see the believer's life in the Spirit, walking with the Spirit. In verse 2, we see the beginning of this thought. Look there in Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now in verse 4, he says we don't walk after the flesh. We don't walk after this world. We don't walk after our own desires and our own lusts, what we want to do. But we walk after the Spirit. Look here in Romans 8, verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, walking after the Spirit there is a capital S. Not our spirit, that new man in us, that's a little s. It's a capital S. God the Holy Spirit. And we walk after the Spirit. That means we follow. We're being led by the Spirit. Having life in Christ, being led by the Holy Spirit in our new man, we then have life and we have peace. Look here in verse 6, Romans 8, 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Against what so many commonly believe, against what's so commonly preached throughout the world, throughout time, since Cain, being spiritually minded does not begin with man. It doesn't begin with me. I don't. I don't make a decision for Jesus. I don't decide, wake up one morning, decide I'm going to be spiritually minded. It's not maintained by my will. I don't start it. I don't keep it up. I don't keep walking after the Spirit. And it doesn't finish with me. It doesn't culminate with man's will. The beginning, the continuance, and the culmination of salvation, of faith, walking in the spirit of regeneration of resurrection of eternal glory is the working and the doing of God Almighty he does it it is solely the work of Christ and him alone working in his people and that leaves all the glory all the credit for taking this sinful worm that I am and making me as righteous as Christ is righteous all that glory is only to him because he did it all. I didn't have hand in it. Our Lord receives all the glory for the saving of his people, for the staying of his people, and for the keeping of his people forever, preserving us for eternity. Now there in verse 10, Romans 8, 10, said, And if Christ be in you, he is in you. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of Righteousness. We have life because of the righteousness of Christ, Him in us. Verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. You see who does the work here? The Lord does. He raises, He quickens, He dwells. He dwells in us. So then it's not that we're... We've done something to make him in debt to us. We're indebted to him. We don't do things to make him owe us. We owe him. Look in verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Not to the flesh, not to ourselves, not to something we did, not to anything in this world. To live after the flesh. But to him. We're debtors to God. Not those things that lead themselves. Those people that lead themselves, they are not the sons of God. But everyone that is led by God, by the Holy Spirit, they are the sons of God. Look here in verse 14, Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, not every person born on this earth is a child of God. Only those that the Spirit leads. Only those that's had a work done in them. Only those that know God. Those are His children. In a sense, all men are his, he owns them, but they're not children. They're not sons. Those he leads, 
We are joint heirs with our Redeemer. Joint heirs with Christ. Look there in verse 17, Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. How is this revealed to his children? How do we know that we're joint heirs? What makes us know that? Look at verse 16. Just look up one verse. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. There's that capital S spirit. It witnesses to that lowercase s, our spirit, our new man. God, the Holy Spirit, that great comforter, speaks to our new man that was put in us. And we are comforted by being reassured we're sons of God. We're sons. We're children of God. And from that we cry, Abba, Father. Our new man, our spirit, our little s spirit, it cries to our heavenly Father. So we that the life, <clears throat> so we see that the life that we have in Christ is given by God. We are led throughout our walk on this earth by the Spirit. We are comforted by the Spirit. We know we are the sons of God by the Spirit. And we cry to our Father, Abba Father, through the Spirit. We're led by the Spirit to cry to Him. Now that brings us to our text here in verse 26. We remember that scripture reading from Jeremiah we had this evening. Jeremiah 31. It says, They shall come with weeping. He said, You're going to come to me weeping. And with all supplications, with the prayer, I will lead them. He said, you're going to come to me crying, but I'm going to lead you in prayer. The first part of this message is going to be a little rough. It might sting with it. But we will see comfort at the end. And this text has helped me greatly. It's been a great comfort to me, and it'll help you too. It'll be a good comfort. So there in Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. We have physical infirmities. We have illnesses. We have sicknesses. We have pain, disease. But we also have something much worse. A much worse infirmity. Not just what we experience in our bodies. We have inward infirmities. We are sick on the inside. In our souls. We're weak inwardly. And that's what the Spirit takes care of. That's what He helps with. Help with our infirmities. And here in our text, Paul is talking specifically about prayer. That's what he's talking about there in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Colon. So we'll help our sicknesses. Now he's about to tell us what, what our sickness is. What our infirmity is. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Believers, not, not every child of Adam, not every sinner that's born on this earth, I'm talking about believers, children of God, sons of God. Paul speaking about them, about me. We have sickness. We have an infirmity. An inability to pray as we ought. We do not know what to even pray for. We don't pray the way we ought, and we don't ask for, and we don't have the prayer that we should have. And as the sons and daughters of God, we ought to know. As his children, we ought to know what to pray for, but we don't. We don't know. Here's a great example of how truly the pray that I am. When I read that text, the first thing I thought of was, I know what I should pray for. Isn't that horrible? He's talking about somebody else. I know. I've been through this. The Holy Word of God just told me that I don't know what I should pray for. And my flesh, it pops up. It puffs. 
gets big and it says, I know what to say. Others might not know, but I know. I know how to pray and I know what to pray for. That's not being brought in weeping. The prayer. It's not being led by the Spirit to weeping the prayer. I must be brought weeping. I must be brought helpless. I must be led, hooked by the hand of the Spirit and led to supplication, led to prayer. I must be brought all the way down and then be led in prayer. We do not like to think, to think of ourselves as weak. I haven't ran in about six years. In my head, I can still run really well. Years ago, I could run a long, long way. Didn't bother me one bit in the world. Wake up the next day feeling fine. So I ran a long time, and I started running again. And I got about a quarter of a mile into that two-mile run, and I was weak. <laughs> I didn't like to accept that. I didn't want to think about that. I didn't want anybody seeing me. I wanted to hide so my neighbors didn't see me. Didn't want to be weak. I don't like to think of myself as weak, but I am. That's when you find out. Let's turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. We're not only talking about being physically weak and unable to do anything outside of God's hand of providence. We are spiritually unable in ourselves. We do not have a, a few infirmities. We are nothing but infirmities. Our flesh is complete sickness, complete infirmity. Now there in Ecclesiastes 6, we'll look at verse 12. Ecclesiastes 6, 12. For who knoweth what is good for a man in this life? All the days of his vain life which he spendeth is a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? We pray for things we think will be good for everyone in the long run. Things that will work together for good. But read that verse again. For who knoweth what is good for a man in this life? How do I know what's good? How do I know what to pray for? All the days of his vain life which he spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? We have no idea what the Lord's providence is for tomorrow. This thing we're going through now in our nation. I didn't see that coming. I didn't know to pray for that. I didn't know to pray against it. And I have my thoughts and my opinions, but I don't know how the Lord's working. I don't know what his will is. We don't know how his providence will be fulfilled, what he's using it for, what's going to be underneath the sun after I'm gone. How can I know what to pray for? Praying in public is a hard thing. To lead a congregation in prayer is a hard thing. And so many times, I'm at a loss for words. How can that be possible? When we consider the great magnitude of of our salvation. We consider the great magnitude of our Savior, His person, His work, His holiness, what He did for just worthless sinners, how He's just and justified. He's accomplished everything for us, for eternity. We're secure in His hand. How could I be the lost for words for that? How could I not have something to be thankful for? Many times, so many look for words coming out of the mouth. We look for the words of the mouth when we pray, not the words from the heart. And that's because we're about to be heard publicly. I'm about to be heard publicly. And if we don't have the words from our heart, we just say something that sounds good. We say something that's worked in the past, something that comforted someone before in the past. Our master called that vain repetition. How guilty, how sinful, how unthankful I am, how evil I am. What 
What a blessing it would be if the Lord would let me pray in public like I'm able to pray in my closet. If I could forget everyone around me. Not worry about my mouth. Worry about my heart. And speak to Him. But even that is infirmity. When I'm in my closet, that closet of our heart, we go into the room and closet of our hearts. That's an infirmity. When you pray in your heart silently, in private, you're at home, your mouth doesn't open. Does your mind wonder? You try to pray to the Lord, and next thing you know, you're thinking about fishing, or laundry, or oil changes, or anything around you. I need to replace this carpet. Something. The flesh that we live in is far more infirm. It's far sicker and diseased than we know. We're bad off. So back to our text. We just heard some brutal honesty. <laughs> some plain, hard truth. But we're about to get some good things. That part's about over. We are not alone. I'm not alone. Look here in verse 26 again. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we, we know not what we should pray for as we ought. The great Apostle Paul, so many people look up to. There's been so many books written about him. The one who labored more than them all. And that's true. He wrote more than New Testament than anybody. In, in my head, that's a, probably the strongest believer to ever lived. John the Baptist of Adam's seed, born of, uh, born of man. But he's in the same boat I am. He's in the same boat we are. He said there in Romans seven fifteen, for that which I do, I <clears throat> that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate. That I do. That's me. I do so many things I don't want to do, and I don't do the things I do want to do. And we, we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We're not alone in this. In the sense of our sin nature, it's sad how low I am. But in the light of salvation in Christ, how wonderful that statement is. Our brethren suffer and are hindered the same as we are. Those that I esteem much higher than myself, those that I think much highly of, much more than me, they have the same infirmities I have. They have the same sickness I do, the same illness I have. It's almost like we're brothers and sisters in the same house. Ain't it? It's almost like we're related. And together, united in our Lord, as a member of one body, we depend solely on our God for all things. Together, we look to Him for all things. So how, if I'm so low, if I'm so unable, I'm only weeping, how can I look to Christ and trust Him and be comforted? God's mercy towards His people is that He sends us His Spirit. He sends us His Spirit, His comfort. Outside of ourselves, our sick and infirm selves, God sends His Spirit to help our infirmities. Everything we lack in our flesh, God provides for us and in us through His Spirit. Look here in verse 26 again. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit, but the Spirit make itself, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Every time I'm brought to see how horrible my flesh is, how low I am, how I don't do what I ought to do, what a wretched man I am, I read the words, but God, but God, here, but the Spirit, but God, but Christ. 
I cannot and I do not pray as I should. I don't even know what to pray for. But God, but the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit maketh, maketh intercession. It's the, the old English with the E-T-H at the end. He maketh. At the end of that word, it means it happened before. It was made before. It's being made right now. And tomorrow it's going to be made. And the next day it's going to be made. It's made all the time. He maketh intercession. What a blessing. It says there that the intercessions made for us are groanings which cannot be uttered. What does that mean? There's a language that we do not know and we are unable to think and we're unable to speak. We're not able to talk. It's not possible for a man or a woman to utter the holy communication between the Spirit and the Father. We have no clue what to say, and we have no clue how to say it. But God, but the Spirit, makes intercession for His people. He prays for the saints of God in a way that's so glorious and heavenly that you and I cannot even understand what's taking place. Not on this earth, not in our infirmities, not while we're here. Someday we will. There's a, there's a language we've never heard. There's a holiness we talk about that we don't understand. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Just a few pages. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Begin in verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Paul's speaking of himself here. Paul's talking about himself. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. That word lawful means it's not possible. It's not right and it's not possible for a man to even utter the words that Paul heard up there in paradise. Verse 5. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. It's not possible for a man to speak the words that Paul heard there that day in paradise. But God has sent his spirit to his children for the purpose of speaking this heavenly language to God for them and in them. He maketh intercession. But what are these words? What are these words that Paul's talking about? What are these words that the Spirit groans? He said there, But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. What's he talking about? Turn over to Matthew chapter 6. What we are to pray for and the manner in which we are to pray as we ought to us sounds like groanings. Don't sound like much of a prayer to us, not what we think, not our self righteous stuff, selves think. We could never enter into that. What true prayer is. We could never say the right thing. We're not able. Look here in Matthew 6, and verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father. We're not alone, remember that? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Wouldn't that be a great blessing if the children of God could get a hold of that? That the God, heaven and earth, created everything around us that we see. Every tree, every bird, the brick in this wall, the dirt underneath us, the sky above us. He created everything. He controls everything. He controls the molecules in the air. The God. That's our Father. We're His sons. We're His daughters. We can grasp that. Would we ever worry? My earthly father was president of this country. So Grandpa was president of this country. I wouldn't worry too much. 
I wouldn't try not, I'd try not to cause a scene, but I wouldn't be too concerned about what's happening around me. My spiritual father, my eternal father, my heavenly father is my father. It's your father, it's your his. Paul was called up. I wish we could remember that and not forget it. We're his sons. We're his children. Paul was called up to that third heaven. You think he forgot about it? He only mentioned it once. And he never, he couldn't utter it. He couldn't speak those words. If I could be brought to remember that my heavenly father is my father. And that the one whose blood was shed, whose sacrifice, whose sacrifice was accepted for me, the one that willingly laid down his life for me, he ever makes intercession for me at the right hand of the Father. What a thought. The Spirit groans for us. And he says, Oh, Father, when I'm unknowing and I'm unable, the Spirit on our behalf says, Our Father. You and I cannot fully enter into all that entails, but the Spirit speaks for us and says, Our Father. It says there in verse 9, Our Father, which art in heaven, our Father that is in paradise, as Paul said. Christ told that thief on the cross, he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. You talk about something we can't understand. As my brother Gabe says, if the Christ says it's paradise, it ain't the Bahamas. It's better than that. Christ says it's paradise. It's unlike anything that you and I could dream up. It's beyond our comprehension. It's growing. Hallowed be thy name. Holy, reverent, perfect. Words we have to describe God is not fully what he is. Holy. He's holy. Someday, Christ's sheep will worship God for his holiness. In perfection. We will worship him completely for his holiness. But until that day, we're unable. We have infirmities. The Spirit intercedes for us. The Spirit is from heaven. He knows the Father. He knows truly what holiness is. He knows what he's speaking about. And on our behalf, he groans, Holy, holy, hallowed be thy name. In perfect attitude, in perfect knowledge and on our behalf. And all the reverence that God deserves and his, all his majesty deserves and all the fear that he deserves, he cries on our behalf, Holy, hallowed be thy name. Verse 10, Matthew 6, 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, the Lord's kingdom come. My flesh wants to stay here a little longer. I've got children to raise, and I'd say whenever you all are grown, I'm probably gonna have a couple grandbabies. I'm gonna watch, make sure they get through 18. And if I had great grandbabies, I'd wanna watch them make it to 18, make sure they got a good start. And if I had great grandbabies, and on and on, there's a part of my flesh that always wants to stay here. To be honest, my flesh wants to stay here a little longer, but the spirit on my behalf groans. Lord, come. My flesh prays for what I want, the way I want it, and I twist it to make it look like I want His will. And the Spirit groans, Thy will be done. It hurts me and it abases me to be reminded of the things that I ask for in prayer and to tack on, Lord, Your will be done at the end of it. Lord, your will be done. In verse 11 there, it said, Give us this day our daily bread. My flesh asks for physical bread, for comfort in this earth. The Spirit groans, Give us a taste of Christ, our living bread today. Teach us our Redeemer today. Isn't that truly neat? It's more needful than our physical bread. Isn't it? Lord, bless, bless, bless your bread to this body, this new man. And the Spirit of God earnestly asks on behalf of his children, his child receives it. 
he told us, he said, you ask and you shall receive. Look in verse 12, 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I cannot imagine, I cannot utter how often and with how much groaning forgiveness for my sins must be asked for. Lord, forgive us. And he includes us in that. And it says, delete us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Anything that's a temptation in my life, I do not see as an evil temptation. You get that? We don't know what our temptations are. If we did, they wouldn't tempt us. Our flesh talks to anything. Oh, that's a good idea. No, it'd be healthy. That's a temptation. We don't, we're not tempted to grab a, a scald hot tea kettle. That's not tempting. We think it's just fine, whatever we want, and that's why we desire it so much. We think it's okay. Look there in verse 13 again. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I can't enter in to what his kingdom truly consists of. I can't enter into how much power the Lord truly has. I can comprehend those things and the glory that he deserves for all of us. But the Spirit does. The Spirit knows. He groans through intercession for me. What beauty. What a thought. Now back to our text of Romans 8. There's more good news. I'll go quick. Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Capital. Because he makes intercession for the saints why does he do that? According to the will of God. According to the will of God. He searches my heart. And he knows what the Spirit says on my behalf. And he applies that to me. I said, it's counted to me. It's imputed to me. When the Spirit prays on my behalf, the Father looks at me and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. So it be, as you've asked. Look there in Romans 8, verse 15. You know. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba Father. The spirit cries on behalf of God's elect, and it's counted. To us. Lord makes you understand that. We cry. We come weak to Him. And then He leads us in supplication. He leads us in prayer. Isn't that something? I hope that's a blessing to you. Let's pray together. Lord, we come in your presence. We don't know what to ask for. Lord, we don't know how to pray. Our minds are so prone to wonder, but be with us. Lord, send your spirit to make intercession for us. Don't look to us and our sin, Lord. Don't look to what we are, look to Christ. Lord, don't hear our prayers, hear the spirit prayer. Teach us, Lord, teach us today that you are our Father. Teach us your holy. Make us desire your kingdom to come, Lord. What a day it'll be when we get to be with you. Understand how holy you are and worship you for it. Truly worship you. Praise you for all that you've done for us. Lord, be with us till that day. Keep us. In Christ's name we ask. Amen.